Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A word again from the high priestly prayer of Jesus recorded in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Dear friends in Christ, one of the joys in our household is some very is a very well known superhero and his shield. Is a shield of Captain America that's a popular toy in our household. And it's known for when Captain America throws this shield for coming back to him. Yeah, it's the strongest shield in the world, but it also functions as a boomerang. I was thinking about that with this text. I was thinking about another superhero, the mighty Thor. He's got Mjolnir, his hammer that he throws, and by virtue of its own intrinsic powers of returning to the one who's worthy, it always comes back to Thor, too. Interestingly enough, the more I thought about it, the weapon that's named for Boomerang, the Batarang, never returns to Batman. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. He always just throws it and, and it ends up where it ends up, even though it's named for a Boomerang with the word bat in the front. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But my point is, today, if you were listening to what Jesus said, you might discover that you are effectively God's boomerang. Yeah, fellow boomerangs, God sends you out into the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You always come back to God. He sends you out to tell people what you know and love about him, and yet you always come back. You always come back to your Lord. You always come back to the Word. You always come back to the sacrament. You always come back to pray. You always go back to your Lord God. And if you understand what he's saying in his Word, well, you're naturally going to go back out into the world and not live as one of it, but be in it and share the message of that God who loves you so much. And back and forth and back and forth we go. I don't have a whole lot of ways usually of illustrating John 17, so I was actually pretty happy that that came up. There's your big children's message for today. John 17 is almost unfathom, unfathomable. It's, really, it's the easiest Greek, maybe even in the book of John, which is really easy Greek. The language is easy to discern, but the thoughts... The thoughts are so profound. John's known for this, but all the more in this chapter, John 17, where on the night he was betrayed, Jesus Christ offered this great sacerdotal or high priestly prayer to God the Father. We don't often get to listen in to what it is exactly that the Son, the Christ, says to the Father. But here in John 17, no worthier, no holier, no more blessed petition has ever been heard on earth than the words of, of Jesus to the Father, impossible to fathom in its significance and wealth. There was a famous preacher, a Lutheran pietist by the name of Philip Spainer. He refused to preach on this text. He said, it's just too profound. I can't do it. And yet on his deathbed, he, he forced them to read it to him three times all of John 17. I pray that God and the people around me have care enough for the same treatment on my deathbed. Because there's so much in here. Now in the set of verses that we have in this petition for the apostles, Jesus Christ keeps two things in mind when he prays to God the Father. There's a lot of other trappings and a lot of other incredible things that he says, but the, at the core is that they might be kept from the unbelieving and ungodly world, but also that they may be sanctified in the truth to take the word back out into the world. And in so doing, Christ's prayer separates us from and yet sends us into 
the world. If you're Lutheran, you like paradoxes. There's your paradox for today. Two things that really don't seem to make sense together, but they actually do in the Word of God and His Christ. So we'll take a look at how we always come back and that He always sends us out again. Now, one thing to understand as we approach this text is what the disciples should have understood is that Jesus knows the world better than they do. You believe that? Jesus knows the world even better than you. And so when he prays things for you in regard to the world, it's definitely, it's definitely worth listening in because he realized if he left his disciples to their own resources, to their own devices, pretty soon they would be enticed away and they would stray from the faith. Jesus knew that. He knew the hearts of his disciples, but they're not of this world. And Jesus says, just as, just as I, the Christ, am not of this world, so they're not of the world. God, who's holy in and of himself, as such, must react against all that is sinful. And so he'll preserve them from contamination. But this, at this point, it seems to be less the job of the Son and more the job of the Father because Jesus was about to go to his death on behalf of the, these disciples and on behalf of the whole world, all sinners. Now, Jesus knows what both works faith and keeps faith. You know what both works faith and keeps faith? You do. It's God's word. And so he prays for God's word. He prays that God's word would be among his disciples. There's no need to follow the lead of enthusiasts who prattle about new revelations, new age spiritual ideas, and self-help books and ideas. Those tools are nothing compared to the word of the gospel as we have it in scripture for its all sufficient needs. The word is the rock solid foundation of the Christian's faith. You can stand on it. You can trust it time and again and throughout eternity. I was just talking with someone this morning in our congregation, just some of the Psalms that have gotten me through my personal perils is Psalm 25, Psalm 29, Psalm 27, Psalm 23, the Good Shepherd Psalm, Psalm 46, the Mighty Fortress Psalm. Go to Psalm 30 that we often sing in the Easter season. Go to Psalm 29. Go to Psalm 61, the rock that's higher than I. It's just the Psalms. But man, words that were written roughly 3,000 years ago still speak to questions that I have and I didn't even know I had yesterday when I open up the Word and read them today. That's God the Father answering the prayer that Jesus himself offered on, in John 17. And through the power of the word, Jesus asks for a measure of separation between his disciples and the rest of the world. The word he uses is sanctify. We might say consecrate or set apart for God in the word alone. The disciples of Christ are sanctified. Let's be clear, they're separated from the world at the moment that they believed in Jesus Christ. But a lot of this prayer has to do with keeping them sanctified, keeping them set apart from that which has nothing in common with them, and they have nothing in common with it in the unbelieving world. The tool to do that, once again, is the Word. And the tool to keep that, to keep that measure of distance from the world is the word to keep them set apart, sanctified, and consecrated. It's not a spatial set-apartedness, though. It's, it's not necessarily a geographical distance from the, word, from the world. It's, it's a closeness, a proximity to God in all that we do, in all that we think, in how we speak. It should sound different than the world around us. Our actions should look different as we use them to point to the one who had the mightiest and most precious actions on our behalf, the salvation of all human souls. If Jesus was going to keep the disciples away from the world, he was going to ask his Father to use the Word. And he notes a feature of this Word that's all important when it comes to keeping these disciples sanctified. It's that God's Word is 
truth. It's not like you can go and find holes, some geographical problems or some historical problems or some messed up things in the Bible. That part of it isn't true, but really the core values are true. Once you start playing that game, you find out you, you would question even the core values that you find in God's word. Jesus says it very simply. Your word is truth. The words that God has graciously entered into time to give to the prophets and the apostles to write down word for word are God's word. It's intended to keep us from all that's false, all that's impure, all that's unholy. And if there is a mistake in the God-breathed scriptures, then we'd have to accuse God himself. In sin if we were trusting to our own powers to reason that out and figure it and proceed with it, we'd probably end up concluding, no, I actually think I like the world better than the Word of God. If we were trying to figure out what was the pathway to riches, what the, the, the things that the world cares about, fame, maybe glory, maybe romance, or less than desirable types of romance, that we, we just sang about it in, in this hymn, we wouldn't say, what is the world to me? We'd chase after those pleasures and keep those as our temporary treasures. If it were not for the work of the Father and the Son in sending the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, He who is truth, well, we would find ourselves wishing to stay here. But we're set apart by God. And so we know better. We know better from our baptism forward, from from the time we believed and trusted in Jesus and he treasured us more than us choosing him, but that Jesus says, you did not choose me, I chose you. I chose you. From that time forward, we knew there was something different between us and those who surround the word of God, not like hungry recipients, but like hungry vultures to pick off the few, to pick off the flock. The faith believes in God's word alone. And we always return to the word. We always return to the sacrament. We always return to the truth. Um, it's not like Captain America's shield doesn't come back to him. It wouldn't be that useful of a weapon. It would lose its feature. It's not like the mighty Thor's hammer doesn't return to him of its own you know, magical powers. So in the same way, the believer doesn't leave God for very long and really doesn't leave God at all when going out into the world. We always come back to him in our hearts, in our words and actions. So likewise, we don't need to protect God's word, to hide it away. In fact, the word of God has always been the protection of believers. Some of us may think, well, you know, that's really special, God's word. I'll set that Bible up in my house and it'll be a beautiful setting. It's a nice old Bible. And instead of paging through it from time to time, it's just kind of enshrined on the bookshelf. That's a little different than the intention of God's Word. In fact, it's a lot different. That Word was given to you to protect you. Does Captain America hide his shield away and keep it safe so no one can harm it? Well, no, that's his weapon. That's what he uses. It's meant to inflict danger and harm on those who would attack the innocent to preserve the ideals of, well, the stars and stripes. He's Captain America. Just the same way, the mighty Thor doesn't hide away his hammer so that he can keep it from getting any kind of chips or dents. No, he uses it. And so in the same way, God the Son doesn't intend for you to be hidden away. Instead, you are his boomerang. He sends you out into the world with God's word. And it's not always safe. It might be dangerous. It might harm you. It, it might threaten your temporal welfare to go out there. For a lot of us, really all that means is insults, maybe some mockery, maybe some frustration, but does it strike you how few times we can gather up the nerve and muster the opportunity to take, to take it and enter into that conversation, change it into something spiritual so that you can be that 
special weapon that God has cast out into the world and share the message of the truth. The truth that's protected you up to this point, it's not going to fail you in your next conversation, in your next, next witness, and the next time you see a way to be different than the world and make someone think about what it is you believe, what it is that your church teaches. Now, Jesus Christ's prayer states this outright. The Father isn't supposed to remove the disciples at once from the world through death, but instead they were to stay in the world and he, doesn't, he also doesn't pray for some strict separation, like, I want my believers to go off in some desert or in some convent somewhere so that they don't mess up their holiness among the world. No, Jesus says, I'm sending them out right back into the world. I'm not praying that you take them away. I'm praying that you are with them, that you'll guide them and keep them. And we have a petition for this, lead them not into temptation. It's along the very same lines. Because God, out of his immense goodness and mercy, has chosen the eternal law and the divine gospel to be preached and taught in a place like this. And for you to be seated with the message so you can take it out and cast it out into the world. That Jesus Christ died for sinners. That Jesus Christ is the Savior and the Redeemer of all who have human flesh and an eternal soul. That includes every human being that God has formed. He sent you out with that message. And when that message is taught, when that message is witnessed, it comes with power. The same power of God the Father that Jesus, Jesus himself prayed for the kind of power that was bundled up in the Father's word of truth. How does he do that? Well, he sends his boomerang weapon. He sends you. He sends you out to break apart the armor of Satan's forces and to destroy the ramparts of hell. He strikes back on the kingdom of darkness because he's fitted you with his heavenly word of light. So we can say something like this. We can say, one mother armed with the word of God as she sings it or speaks it to the child on her lap, is mightier than any and all armies on earth as they fight, as they continue their their warfare. They have nothing compared to the power of God's word. You might not even know what you're going to say the next time that you have a chance to witness. But it's a pretty good start if you look back at your memory work, your memory treasures of days past, the creed that we recite. There's some pretty good ways of saying it that God has given to you. But even if those things don't come to the tip of your tongue, you know the one who is with you. And that's God's Holy Spirit. Believers are perfectly willing to stand there and be a little uncomfortable knowing that you are God's special boomerang that he's sent out into the world. I mean, you, you, don't, you know you don't belong here. You know that if you're in a position of hatred, it's fine to occupy that position of hatred. If, if it means not being ashamed of the gospel, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Consider those moments where you failed this past week. Consider the forgiveness that Jesus has won you back from those sins, and he feeds you with that week in and week out. And now consider the opportunities. What's that going to look like in this coming week? What are going to be your opportunities where you can be God's special weapon, knowing that you're not alone? I really like thinking about this when I read the book of Isaiah because, you know, someone is called God's secret weapon, his hidden dagger in Isaiah chapter 49. It's the Christ. It's Jesus himself, a secret weapon, only to be revealed in the New Testament when the time had had reached its fulfillment. God revealed who this Christ was, this this individual set apart. In fact, um, this individual who was born and bred, not just someone who worked up the might and the righteousness to become God, as if that's any kind of savior, but he who was true God before anything else was. Not, the, not the, 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 uh, the one who was created before everything else was created, but the uncreated, the true God who 
took on human flesh to be you and me, to be the substitute for our salvation. This was God's secret weapon. Knowing this, you understand that before you're brought home eternally to heaven, you, his boomerang, will bring that gospel message of a Savior out into the world in the name of Jesus and none other. Amen. Please stand.